This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 4th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what concerns us most right now about Alaska oil? Second, the emerging issue in the state CARES Act debate and what our congressional delegation could do to help. And third, what those involved in the Restore the PFD rallies need to be ready to answer. And now, let's join Michael. The weekly top three, we uh, we watch and continue to watch as the markets do their thing. Things are crazy. Oil prices. I mean, we just there's so much uncertainty. Um, we got a lot of things to go over. First and foremost, uh, let's take a look at oil. That is your top concern right now. Well, as number one, let's uh, let's talk about that. Well, Michael, uh, let's start with the good news this morning. Oil is uh, the futures market uh, for oil is up. Uh, it's actually having a very, very uh, uh, positive day. Brent, uh, the front month of Brent right now is July. Uh, it's what's trading. It is. It started the morning at uh, $28. It's now over 30. It's up around 10%. Uh, it's having a strong opening. You go all the way down the strip. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess I got to chuckle at the fact I'm saying thirty dollars is a strong is a strong market, but right, right. but the, it's, the new it's normal, thir- right? Yeah, but it's thirty dollars, and and WTI, uh, the futures for WTI, the front month for WTI is June, um, and it's up uh, uh, about four dollars this morning. It started around uh, twenty or settled yesterday around twenty. It's up above twenty four, so um, so it's doing well. So 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 the the the. I, I want to start by saying uh, the oil markets are up this morning, um, and so that's a good sign. The, the, here's here's the issue that that is is concerning me, and and frankly, is is a significant concern if it persists. And that is while the markets are up, A and S, uh, which is what we dep- which is the price for Alaska North Slope uh, crude on the West Coast, which is what. Most people, including me, look to as the as sort of the marker price for uh, for the the oil that's being sold that produces revenues for state government and produces revenues produces jobs for Alaskans. Um, it is lagging uh, significantly. We've talked about this in prior shows, but but for example, uh, in May thus far, the couple of days reported for May, but but continuing back into April. While Brent has been in the mid 20s, and A and S, which has historically followed Brent, uh, has still been way down in the teens. There's a there's a thirteen dollar spread uh, so far in May uh, between Brent, the average price of Brent, uh, and the average price of A and S. Put another way, A and S is selling at a roughly a fifty percent discount uh, to uh, to Brent. Um, Brent was has been twenty average twenty six so far in May. A and S is has averaged around fourteen, um, and A and S isn't even tracking uh, WTI, the other major uh, 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 crude standard or 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 price that, that people follow. Uh, WTI so far in May has averaged around twenty dollars. Again, A and S is around. 
$14. So it's been about a third, a little under a third uh, below WTI. That is a significant concern because, because if that continues, if that new relationship that we've seen form in the middle of, of the of the downturn, the oil downturn as a result of the of COVID. If that relationship continues, uh, l taking a look, for example, at uh, uh, at fiscal year 21 that's coming up, the the uh, Department of Revenue is estimated that the price. And this is before COVID hit, but the Department of Revenue estimated the price, average price for ANS at 20 at 37 dollars uh, for FY 21. Uh, right now, uh, that looks uh, high for even for Brent. Brent right now, if you look at the forward strip, um, is a, is averaging around $32 uh, a barrel for FY21. WTI is averaging around uh, $28 for FY21. But if you take the differential, the differential that's formed since mid-April for ANS between between a the ANS price and Brent, ANS averages around $22 uh, for uh, FY21 compared to the $37 uh, that's in the budget. So it's, I mean, oil prices generally are bad, but ANS has fallen into this hole uh, that uh, that makes our situation even worse. Um, if I've I've looked around for comparisons of what ANS is comparing to. Uh, and it is ANS is sort of tracking uh, a sort of a submarket price called WTI Midland, um, and it's sort of tracking uh, WCS Western Crude Select, which is a which is a Canadian price, basically the price for the oil sands. Um, and those have always been sort of considered submarket, um, uh, isolated uh, inland. Uh, prices reflecting reflecting transportation costs and reflecting uh, quality differentials between those those markets uh, or those crews that are going into those sub markets and uh, and and the bigger markets WTI and and Brent. Right. The the concern I have is that is that A and S may be falling into beginning to fall into a sub market, and and if it does, um, if it if it's if it's become disconnected from Brent and become disconnected from WTI, even as the as the world oil price sort of recovers back up to levels that that we talked about uh, for Alaska when we did the budget, uh, ANS isn't following uh, up to those levels. So that's that's a huge concern. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely when you look at this and you see that it's uh, effectively, you know, 60 percent of what it's supposed to be. Uh, that's uh, that's definitely going to affect us in a in a tough way. Uh, is oil storage one of the big issues? Is it the oil storage? Is it the Saudi uh, the Saudi flood? We're still feeling it. Is it the overhang from that? What what is what is the main cause of this, Brad Keithley? I, I think I think it is. I think it, hopefully it is the Saudi flood. It is the 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 sort of the micro market issues that are affecting the West Coast. West Coast doesn't have that much storage. So what you're finding is a lot of uh, a lot of, of the ships that are coming in, a number of the ships that are coming into the West Coast, are sort of having to stand at stand at sea, being the floating storage, uh, as the West Coast market starts, you know, working off uh, the overhang. Um, and we've got one ship. Uh, I've started following tankers to try to figure out what's going on. We've got one <laughs> tanker. Um, ANS has a lot. The ANS tanker fleet is is ten ships. We've got one tanker that's uh, that's standing off the coast. Well, two actually right now that are standing off the coast, seem to be caught up in sort of that that surplus. And and one can hope that as as that West Coast micro market sort of clears, uh, that that you know as as the Saudi flotilla sort of you know dissipates um, is not renewed and and we work off the the surplus that build up um, and as the the surplus oil from from other places gets worked off and prices strengthen one can hope that the ans market comes back into uh, back into in, into you know the status it was and ans comes back up to brent and and then we can worry about the bigger picture of oil prices going down as opposed to this micro market issue but it's but but that there's a there's a question about how long that's going to stay i mean 
since we last spoke, Conoco announced that it's going to cut 100,000 barrels a day from from its production um, in in Alaska in June, as a way of trying to soak up some of this, uh, some absorb some of the problems that are in the market. Um, there's one ship, uh, one of the uh, the ANS tankers has been uh, sent to China uh, with a with a cargo of crude um, to try to because there isn't a home for it on the west coast. Um, and so it, one one can hope it's going to it's going to dissipate, but there's there's a question now about how long that's going to take to dissipate. Dissipate. We may see it into July. We may see it into August before all of this excess crude is worked off. That sort of depends on how strong, how soon California and the West Coast open back up. Right. And it's, it doesn't depend on how soon Alaska opens back up. It depends upon how soon the West Coast opens back up. Um, and and there, I have this, I have this gut concern that that ANS may have slipped into uh, one of these one of these submarket uh, uh, status, uh, and we may not see ANS climb back up into the relationship with Brent and WTI that it's historically had, and and that will that will be that will be a serious concern. We think we have it bad um, uh, in the budget uh, and in the state now, with with oil prices generally coming down. If we've slipped into a submarket, um, and we're now going to price at the discount to Brent and WTI. Uh, that's going to make things worse. I mean, it's going to make the budget worse, but it's also going to make things worse, like investment decisions. I right, mean, right. Investment investment decisions on the slope will be affected as well. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, Brad, what does this mean when you, you keep talking about Alaska budgets? What is the effect of this on the budget, uh, short term and long term? Here, we got about three minutes. Oh well, uh, if we have if we uh, have a if we stay in this submarket uh, through FY21 um, and the differential something somewhere around the current differential continues, oil revenues will be virtually uh, uh, negligible. Uh, I mean, even if the tax act would pass, the tax initiative pass, oil, oil revenues are virtually neg- negligible. We're already looking at uh, for FY21, uh, assuming for a moment that spending stays static from FY20, uh, we're already looking at a deficit of 1.8 billion uh, uh, from uh, counting the P- PFD at, at, uh, at uh, 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 POMV 5050. We're already looking at a deficit of 1.8 billion. If if oil prices stay low, we're going to be looking at a deficit. Out of a $4.6 billion budget, we're going to be looking at a deficit that is um, easily uh, uh, 2.5 billion. Um, so it, it's, I mean, it's it's an order of magnitude thing, right? It's 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 a um, we're already deep in the hole in terms of the FY21 budget. We're already looking at this huge yawning budget gap. Uh, in the FY21 budget, it'll just become, uh, he'll become, you know, the Grand Canyon on steroids that we're facing at, uh, facing uh, if uh, if oil prices don't recover. So it's, it's, um, it, it, it means, it means more tax, it means, you know, it, it, even if you, it means even if you, even if you eliminate the PFD, you've got a huge amount of taxes uh, sitting on top of everything else. I mean, the PFD, uh, is about one, eliminating the PFD would raise about 1.3 billion. Um, if we've got a 1.8 billion dollar deficit um, uh, before going into PFD elimination, if you el- eliminate and, and and we have a 2.5 billion dollar deficit, if oil prices stay down, eliminating the PFD gets you 1.3 billion. Um, that means either huge budget cuts. Well, it probably means a combination of huge budget cuts and a tax. Uh, on top of it. it, it is it is a um, come to Jesus moment for Alaska. Frankly. <laughs> Wonder what this will do to the BP sales, says Jim. BP sales going going forward. Last we heard, um, they're they're. I mean, maybe they're trying to get shut of their stuff before the thing really craters down. Um, I don't know, uh, but last we heard, it was still on, right, Brad? Yeah, it, that was BP's announcement last week that it was still on. That they had renegotiated the terms. The purchase price was still the same, but the 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 payment schedule and the payment process um, uh, for that purchase price uh, have been 
apparently significantly changed um, and in a way that uh, that enabled the sale to continue to go forward. There is one aspect, a lot of aspects of that sale that, I, that trouble me. There, there is one aspect of that sale that may relate to the issue, that may come back and relate to that issue uh, that we were talking about in the first segment, uh, which is the, the disconnect of ANS from WTI and Brent. Um, BP owns one of the refineries on the West Coast. And so to a degree, BP has a secure market, at least for its oil, uh, into the West Coast and, and, and is really not at risk of that oil being uh, being backed out uh, uh, as 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 apparently some of the others are, given that we are shipping a tanker to China now. Um, after the sale, uh, BP will continue to own the refinery. The refinery is not part of the sale, so after the sale, BP will continue to own the refinery. But Hill and so and so Hill Corp uh, will become like Conoco um, and Exxon, frankly, because Exxon doesn't own a West Coast refinery either. In the sense that they that, that they won't have a re, they won't have a refinery they won't be vertically integrated there won't be a a, a guaranteed market or a semi guaranteed market uh, right. for their production into the West Coast and that seems to that disconnect seems to be part of what's going on uh, in this price disconnect um, so to the so that disconnect between ownership of a West Coast refinery ownership of your market um, and uh, and production. That disconnect that will occur as a result of the BP Hillcorp sale may 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 also continue sort of to create this submarket that we that we see out there right now uh, for uh, for ANS production. It won't help it. It won't help cure the submarket, uh, and it may it may reinforce uh, the submarket aspects of it. So there's there's some concern. I think as a result of the sale, which does appear to be going forward, uh, there's some concern. Uh, also, with respect to that aspect of the sale as well, I hate to recycle stuff, but uh, uh, but Jim is 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 uh, is is going to bring this back up, Brad. And I know I think we answer this every week. Jim says, "Raise, raise, raise, raise." How about some flipping cuts, cuts, cuts? He goes, "I think Brad has lost his mojo on sustainable budgets. His goal seems more capitulation." And I think that that's probably furthest from the truth. You and I may disagree on some things, but I think that that's furthest from the truth. Um, I think we've attempted the cuts route. Um, I mean, cuts are going to be inevitable at some point because there's just not going to be any money and you can't tax it at the level that would be required to sustain it. But there has been no political will for taxes or for cuts, right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, Jim needs to be talking to legislators, not at me. Uh, we, we tried that. Governor Dun Dunleavy tried that in his first budget. Most people on this on this listening to this broadcast will remember that. Tried that. He cut a billion dollars from the budget. He couldn't get 16 out of 60 legislators to back up the cuts at that level. Now he did get 16 uh, to back him up at at cuts that were about 750 million dollars higher, cuts of about 250 million dollars instead of the billion dollars. Uh, but he couldn't get 16 to back him up at the at the billion dollar cut level. So, yeah, I I haven't lost I haven't lost my resolve. I know exactly where those cuts can be made. We've talked about them on the show since uh, since 2012, 2014, um, and you can you can pinpoint where those cuts can be made, and I can repeat them over and over and over. But there aren't there in this current legislature there aren't even 16 legislators that will back it up. And if you want if you want to talk about you know the, where the resolve is. The governor this year, even in the face of, of what we knew when he signed the budget, the FY21, the FY21 budget, FY20 budget, uh, the FY21 budget, even when he signed the FY21 budget, um, uh, knew that the revenues were, were dropping like a rock, he signed uh, a budget of $4.6 billion, which was roughly the same uh, as, as the year before. Revenues were falling from FY20. Um, uh, we knew revenues were falling from FY20. We knew it was it was likely going to be a persistent situation throughout um, FY21. Yet he signed a budget of 4.6 billion dollars. He didn't veto it. So, you know, Jim, if you want to if if you want to complain to somebody, go complain to legislators and go complain to the governor. Right. You know, my, Michael and I have outlined where those cuts could be made. <laughs> time and time and time again, we just need the players to actually carry the ball. 
we can only throw the ball so far. They've got to actually carry it. And the problem is we've got to change out the players to be able to make that happen. We're through number one. We're on to number two. Number two is this tug of war that appears to be laying out between the governor and the legislature. The governor wants to get this money uh, out there as quickly as possible. He'd ask for them to make uh, their final, the LMB, the Management or Budget and Audit Committee, LBA committee, to uh, uh, to make their decisions last Friday. They released a sliver of that money. Uh, and I think it's interesting, uh, Senator Mia Costello is in the chat room, and she... Uh, and she quoted a, uh, a piece of Alaska statute, which for some reason has jumped off my screen. Here we go. It goes, uh, she quotes Alaska statute 2623050 section C that says, Nothing in this section limits the governor's authority to apply for, receive, administer, and spend grants, gifts, or payments from any source to aid in disaster prevention, preparedness, response, or recovery. Uh, and that seems to be something that many legislators have forgotten. It just seems, Brad, that this becomes more and more each day about the politics of it, how they can't have the governor even have a perceived win. Like he would be the one that would be handing out the money, so that's a win for the governor. That seems to be politics playing into this. Am I am I wrong? No, no. There's a huge amount of politics that are playing into it, and and I, I, I still just shake my head every time I think about the Giesel von Hemhoff letter to – to uh, Senator Mnuchin, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, uh, you know, complaining about the governor, uh, complaining about the process the governor was go- was initially going to go through to distribute these funds. Uh, sort of, it, it reminded me a lot of you know tattling. It reminded me a lot of a you know grade school classroom, um, uh, and you know the the kids who would tattle to the teacher on. Uh, on what was going on, not really understanding, not trying to work out with the other kid that they were tattling on uh, the process. They just wanted to run to the teacher and say, "Look at him! Look at him!" And that and that's that's really what what you know, the Giesel right. von Emhoff letter uh, made me think of, and still makes me think of every time. But but here here's the here's to me the bigger issue, and I think it's it's a more substantive issue. I think we'll get uh, it's taking too long, but I think we'll get uh, get the process between the legislature and the governor. Uh, resolved and 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 identified, you know, where the funds need to go and get whatever authority we need for those funds uh, to be distributed. The problem is um, that about five hundred million dollars of those funds are to go to uh, are are intended for local government or designated for local government. A little bit over five hundred million right now, um, and 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 local government certainly has a need. I mean, sales tax revenues are down. Uh, in those locations that depend upon uh, uh, sales tax revenues, uh, like the Matsu and, and Southeast Alaska, certainly those revenues are going to plummet. Um, and 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 there are other uh, uh, issues with some of the other uh, locations. The 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 COVID funds, uh, the CARES Act funds that that go to the localities though are under a restriction, sort of a sort of this generalized restriction that they're to be used for. Uh, COVID relief or for COVID related costs. That makes sense in areas like California or certainly New York City um, and, and the state of New York where their COVID costs are through the roof. I mean, they have, they have, you know, had to deal with a number of patients. They've had to you know, undertake special costs to, to be ready to deal with, uh, with COVID related costs. So they're able to absorb their local funds uh, as a result of of and, and put them to the use that that uh, that that Congress intended. Well, at least the Treasury Department says Congress intended, which is which is COVID relief. But in Alaska, where we've not at least you know cross your fingers not had the same sort of cost uh, related to COVID. Uh, we're not what the local governments are saying is we're not going to be able to use those funds, all those funds that 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 Congress has appropriated uh, for that purpose. And so we're going to have a situation in which, for example, sales taxes are down, sales tax revenues are down, um, and the COVID funds are there, but you can't use them to to help to help uh, deal with deal with COVID costs. But you can't use those funds because they're not explicitly related to, uh, to to dealing with COVID. They're, they're sort of a knock-on effect. They're not, you know, they're not for hospitals. They're not for uh, responders and, 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 and all of those sorts of, 
all of those sorts of direct activities, uh, direct costs related to COVID. So we've got a situation in which Alaska has dollars that came from the CARES Act, but but even once we resolve this issue between the governor and the legislature, uh, we're not going to be able to apply those dollars, or at least the, the thinking right now is we're not going to be able to apply those dollars, uh, or the local governments are not going to be able to apply those dollars. That's so so. You know, we've also got a situation nationally where states are saying we need more dollars from Congress. I mean, uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi has said the next COVID Act, uh, the next CARES Act type uh, uh, appropriation may contain a billion dollars uh, for the states. And, you know, that's a problem in and of itself because we're already running these huge national deficits. Adding another billion dollars on that's just, you know, I, I, we're just leaving a horrible legacy to, to future generations as a result of the debt of the debt we're piling up. But in Alaska, we've got and, and that may be true for New York. It may be true for Ohio, maybe true for California states that have really had a lot of covid, uh, a lot of covid related activity. And they've absorbed the, the dollars from the first tranche uh, in, in respect to those. But in Alaska, where we've not had the sort of sort of costs that they're experiencing in other places, uh, what would be better for us, rather than wait around for this next tranche uh, of a billion dollars um, in in allocations to the state, is just be able to use the funds we've got. Uh, that could come in in two ways. One is it could either come through congressional action, um, is saying for for example, saying for states that have not had. Uh, uh, who are not using all their funds for COVID related? You can use them for other funds as well. The purpose is to get those funds into into the localities, sort of regardless of how they go in. Use them first for COVID, but but you can use them for other purposes if uh, if you don't have all the COVID costs. It could come from congressional action, or frankly, it could come from the treasury. The 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 the, the congressional act um, uh, is fairly nebulously worded. Um, uh, there's a lot of room for interpretation in that act. What's happened is Treasury, frankly, concerned, I think, a little bit about the debt we're running up. Uh, Treasury's regulations implementing implementing the act uh, have been, in many instances, tighter uh, than what than what some intended, some thought the, the act itself uh, was doing. So right. possibly the other way to resolve this is to uh, is to have Treasury address it through. Uh, through regulations, but in some fashion, uh, one, even once all the smoke clears about this this controversy between the legislature uh, and uh, and the governor, in some fashion we've got to be able to free up those state funds because we've got, you know, we're going in Southeast uh, w without without tourists and without the sales tax revenue that generates, that's going to be just a huge hit to Southeast. We're already seeing that uh, in other places. Some complain about the governor's vetoes. Uh, adding to that burden, but you know, where's, where's that money going to come from if the if the state tries to make it up for make up for it by restoring the funds from the veto? That just you know, that's just going to come from creating deep, deeper deficits at the state at the state level. So, right. we, we, in some fashion, we've got to find a way to free up those 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 COVID funds to use them for things that make sense for Alaska. Uh, it makes sense in a way for Alaska that. Uh, that maybe they don't elsewhere, but but we certainly have a need for those funds and, and need to be able to use them broadly. Well, the legislature has to act. The governor can release the funds eventually, but we're talking about 45 days down the road. 45 days is the limit on what it is now. Some of that clock has already run out, but the sooner we get this money flowing in the economy, the sooner we can make some of the, you know, that, that some of this relief can come out. And I don't know how much longer we're going to, uh, you know, the legislature is going to dilly dally around, or the LBA is going to dilly dally around with this. They're supposed to meet tomorrow, but no real answers yet. I mean, essentially, the 125 million is less is like just under 10 percent of what the overall monies are. The rest of it's just sitting there, not helping anything. Yeah, and, absolutely right, Michael. But, yeah. But what I guess what I'm saying is, even once that smoke clears, even once the legislature and the governor. Uh, uh, resolve their issues. We may have, you know, a, a substantial portion of that $500 million um, still sitting there, unusable because of the per perception around the, the restrictions around the congressional limitations. Right. Well, and this is the problem with Congress not being specific enough and allowing the, you know, we, we leave it vague enough to allow interpretation by bureaucracies, and bureaucracies don't seem to be making the best choices on this. Uh, it, it, 
We're down yeah, to and, one and, and it's one it's one other instance where Alaska is different uh, from other states. Other states have had heavy COVID hits and are spending a lot of money on COVID. Alaska sort of protected itself uh, uh, in a way by sort of shutting down our economy to a degree harder than other places. Um, and and what we should be what what we need to be able to use those funds are or to help support local government as opposed to use it on COVID expenses because we didn't have that many COVID expenses. So Brad, your number three was that the the restore the PFD rallies are great, but those who support those need to be ready to answer the next question. And your next question is, okay, fine. So how do we fix? How do we fix what's what's broken? How do we fix what's there? The numbers that are already there, right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's those PFD rallies were great, and and they're they're going to keep them going, and I think that's a great thing to do. But here's here's the issue that we're facing. Um, we talked about it in the first segment, but here's the issue we're facing in FY22 uh, when the legislature comes in next year. We're going to have this huge gap, 1.8 billion dollars, even if our even if our our revenue forecast is right. If our revenue forecast is wrong, you know, well beyond two billion dollars in terms of a deficit. Um, how how are we going to close that deficit? If if, if you say pre- protect the PFD, since we're out of savings, you know, keep in mind we're out of savings. We've gone through the SBR and we're 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 going through the we're almost out of the CBR. If we're if we're out of savings, how are we going to close that deficit? Um, uh, uh, in, 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 in any fashion, uh, if you're going to protect the PFD, great, absolutely great. I'm there with you. I want to do it, but we're going to have to have some other source of revenue then to, to close that revenue gra- gap. I know Jim's going to say, you know, well, we'll just cut it all. Well, we're not going to cut. Let's get realistic. We're not going to cut $2 billion out of a $4.6 billion budget in one year. And we don't have any savings to get us over the hump anymore. We've used that all up from 2012 to uh, to now, so that's that's not going to happen. And what the legislature is going to be faced with when they come in next session is, all right, we got this huge budget hole. How are we going to close it? Many are going to say we're just going to eliminate the PFD. That'll get us a billion three, right? Uh, out of out of that two billion or out of that one point eight billion two billion dollar hole. Um, and 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 they're going to say yes, we're going to have to cut cut uh, cut some, and and you know even if we cut five hundred million, which we haven't managed to do. At any point in the last eight years, but even if we cut 500 million, we're still going to have this, you know, 1.3 billion dollar deficit. How are we going to close that? And and in order to protect the PFD, the those who want to protect the PFD are going to have to have an answer to that. And and the answer of we'll just cut the rest of it isn't going to fly. And if that's the only answer, legislators are going to say, well, you don't have a better answer. We're just going to take the PFD then. So. When, it's great to have the restore the PFD, save the PFD rallies, all for it. Terrific, terrific use of, of, of human ingenuity and willpower. Uh, but the next question is, how are we going to close this budget deficit if, if we preserve the PFD? And I think that is, uh, you know, that's been the million dollar or billion dollar question for years. Uh, and again, we've proven a, a, again and again that, you know, the governor took a bold step, couldn't get the support to it right now. Uh, I mean, I think the bottom line, as I've been saying for the last two and a half, three years, is that, uh, you know, we've got to change out the people that are there. Because since there is no political will, then replace those players that are standing in the way. And maybe you just move a few key players. I think that, you know, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about somebody just said fungible in the chat in the chat room, you know, w- when you talk about this, if you remove some of those key players, uh, the Geisels, the Von Imhoffs, the Stedmans, the Bryce Edgmans of the world, um, you know, some of these 16 would have been fungible enough to be able to come back and go, OK, I can support that now uh, and make it happen. And then maybe some of these cuts can be made. We don't have to do it all in one fell swoop, but we need to change a good chunk of them to be able to change the overall philosophy of the legislature. Michael, I agree with that. That's that's great. But we're not talking about even a billion dollars anymore in cuts. We're now talking about a billion eight uh, in cuts. And that's even if oil prices, you know, somehow miraculously get back up to $33 uh, on the year. If we've fallen into a micro market, or even if not, even even if you look at where Brent is right now, that billion eight quickly becomes two billion and quickly becomes over two billion. So, we're, and, and we have no savings to cushion us forward. 
So we're we're talking about a a cut figure that is that is in all honesty unattainable. Right. And so and so you have to answer the question let's say let's let's say we get 500 million dollars again a, a figure we have not achieved over the last 8 years other than through capital spending cuts we've not achieved 500 million dollars in operating budget cuts let's let's say we get to 500 billion or 500 million dollars which is a which is a huge number let's say we let's say we get there we're still a billion 3 short even assuming oil prices hit 33 dollars let's say we get to a billion dollars we're still 800 million dollars short Assuming oil prices get to thirty three get to thirty three dollars. It there is no cuts only option anymore on the table. That that that's, ship that's that, that's that, the effect of the oil price drop. That ship has sailed is what you're saying. I mean this I remember when we first started talking, Brad, back in twenty thirteen or whatever it was. Uh, when we said, uh, you know, the ISA report said we had to pull it back to a sustainable level by this date. And that date kept moving and the number kept going up because, or going down. The budget number, sustainable number, kept going down because we failed to hit it again and again and again. And that window is now closed. There is no sustainable, balanced a- a- approach where all the monies can still remain. Yep. There, there is no real if, – if, if we had gradually brought it down – since 2012, maybe the last step would be achievable, but we haven't. Right. You know, and and we've got all these constituencies out there. You can't cut K through 12. You can't cut the university. You can't cut Medicaid. You can't cut this and you can't cut that. I, okay. Can't do it. Can't do it. Fine. Where's the revenue going to come from? And they're, they're, you know, the top 20% are just sit, sitting out there going, well, you know, we got a place. We'll just cut the PFD. It's welfare anyway, or whatever, you know, whatever argument of the day they use. Yeah. Um, well, uh, to save it, we, we're going to have to come up with an alternative revenue. All right. Well, we're up against the break. We got to jump back into it. Tuckerman has made a, a a point about the one billion in the power cost equalization fund and others. I think we should talk about that next time. All these different funds that could save more of us and maybe give us a little more time to fix it with more cuts. But uh, we're out of time. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.